3 First Alert Weather. Well, this morning we are dealing with some dense fog. I'll time it out for you coming up in three minutes. All right, thank you, Nicole. Straight ahead, a missing university. Auburn University student's car is found reopening a 45-year-old cold case. What was found inside, plus what investigators are hoping to learn next. And coming up, health experts say some pregnant women are not getting vaccinated. How they say the lack of protection puts both mother and baby at risk. Plus, relief is on the way to folks in East Alabama who could be facing eviction. Details as News 3 this morning starts right now. On your side, this is News 3 this morning. Well, good morning to you. You're waking up to December 9th, 2021, just one day away from Friday. I'm Blake Eason. And I'm Crystal Whitman, and thank you for watching News 3 this morning. We begin in Troop County surrounding new details in a 45-year-old cold case after a missing Auburn University student's car was found when he, with human remains inside. Now, investigators say on January the 27th, 1976, 22-year-old Kyle Klinkscale left from the Moose Club in LaGrange to drive back to Auburn University, but he never arrived. This week, the Troop County Sheriff's Office confirmed his white Tudor car was found in a Chambers County Creek. Authorities say skeletal remains were inside. Now, at this time, Troop County investigators cannot confirm if they are Kling Scales remains. The GBI is working to identify them. Take a listen. Hopefully, we'll find something we may never know. But we are glad today. You know, Ms. Kling Scale, his mother, died just this year in January. And it was always her hope that he would come home. It was always our hope that we would find him for her before she passed away. So just the, the fact that we have hopefully found him and the car brings me a big sigh of relief. Now, previous reporting indicates two people, Jimmy Jones and Gene Johnson, were arrested on various charges connecting with Klinksclo's disappearance. Those charges include concealing a death and making false statements. Now, for details about this decades-long investigation, head to WRBL.com. Back in Muskogee County, a man arrested on felony theft charges is now the suspect in an Alabama homicide. 19-year-old Solomon Cooper of Climax, Georgia, has been in the Muskogee County Jail since November 15th. According to police, recent developments now tie him to an unrelated case, the murder of 20-year-old Sincere Tyson. Tyson was shot in his Dothan home while he was sleeping nearly two months ago back on October 9th. Police say evidence points Cooper to this crime, and he is now charged with capital murder. Authorities say once the unrelated theft charges are addressed in Georgia, Cooper will then be extradited to Alabama and held without bond. And also in Alabama, a driver is facing charges after police say he sped towards a parade full of families in Hayden. Investigators are looking into an incident after police say a driver sped towards that parade. Uh, parents pulled their children away as a car sped through the annual parade Tuesday night. According to Hayden Police Chief James Chapman, Tony Nix, ignored flashing blue lights as he got closer to the crowd. Investigators say Nix was parked along the already blocked parade route when at some point he drove forward. Our police officers were, had tried to stop him at the intersection. I put my car in park and I jumped out chasing the car. And uh, the band members that were behind my car, uh, they were jumping and scattering out of the way. We, we were very fortunate that nobody got hurt. And according to court documents, Nix is accused of flipping off an officer. He tells officers that he didn't know they were trying to stop him. So charges have been filed and more are expected as this investigation continues. And time now to turn to meteorologist Nicole Phillips, who has the wake-up forecast to get you rolling on this Thursday. Nicole, the fog was out and about on my way in this morning. Yes, it is. And we've got a dense fog advisory until 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern time. It's for the county shaded in gray here. And this is why. I mean, most of us here are struggling to see any type of good visibility for us to get out and about. So 10 miles, that's where we want to be. That means you can see 10 miles out ahead of you. But when we have this fog here, that's not the case right around Columbus and Fort Benning, and we're even seeing that here on Phoenix City Amphitheater. So allow yourself some extra time this morning. Other than that, it is pretty calm, and today will be one of those calm days. Temperatures are sitting in the 30s and 40s this morning, 32 up in the Grange, 41 in Auburn. So we'll be dealing with fog this morning. Then we'll see an increase of clouds as we go throughout the rest of today, 65 degrees by 4 p.m. We've got some changes in our forecast, which also include the chance for some strong storms by Saturday. I'll time that out for you coming up in 10 minutes. All right.
Alrighty, thank you, Nicole. Turning now to the fight against COVID-19, where it appears we may have a familiar tool to fight that newly discovered Omicron variant. More than 200 million Americans are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and now many are turning to booster shots for more protection against the new variant. In recently announced findings, Pfizer says its additional shot increases protection against that new variant by 25%. That will induce immunity that is likely to protect from infection, symptomatic illness, and severe disease. Only about a quarter of eligible Americans have received a booster. Meanwhile, COVID-19 hospitalizations jumped nearly 30 percent in the past month, driven by that Delta variant. I knew this morning doctors are sounding the alarm about the low number of pregnant people getting vaccinated. Right now, the number of unvaccinated moms stands at 30%. Now, according to health officials, getting vaccinated while pregnant is not only good for the mom, but the baby as well. Uh, doctors say that in the last two months, she's seen new complications for unvaccinated pregnant women who developed COVID and five cases. The unborn babies were very sick and expectant mothers also noticed their babies were moving less or not at all. Take a listen. Pregnant women have a higher risk of getting severe illness. They're not getting enough oxygen from the placenta. Most women with COVID don't have this severe manifestation. Um, but those babies that we have seen have been quite ill and have had to be delivered prematurely because they look so sick. Now, health experts emphasize that this is rare, but it is new and it is alarming. They also add not, this is not a complication in vaccinated patients. And we thank you so much for trusting WRBL News 3 this morning as your favorite source right when you wake up. Well, coming up, President Biden signs a new executive order committing the U.S. to clean energy. We'll break it all down for you coming up. But first, here's meteorologist Nicole Phillips for a quick look at your Thursday weather. Uh, not a bad day, but some fog out there now, Nicole. Yeah, we've got some fog this morning, and that will lift by the mid-morning. But we're going to see an increase of clouds and calm today, 65 degrees. I'm tracking some changes in our forecast. Details coming up at 13 minutes past the hour. News 3 is on your side with Crystal Whitman, Blake Eason, and meteorologist Nicole Phillips has your first alert forecast. On your side, you're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. Well, welcome into News 3 this morning. The federal government plans to cut its carbon emissions by 65% by the end of the decade. Take a look at this. President Joe Biden's executive order signed yesterday sets the goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. The White House plans to spend billions on a fleet of electric vehicles and upgrades to federal buildings with clean energy. And with a stalemate between cereal maker Kellogg and its striking plant workers, the company now says it plans to permanently replace the 1,400 union members after they rejected a new contract. Those workers had hoped for higher wages and enhanced benefits, but the company says it has no plans to meet with the union. Now let's take a look at the holidays. The hardest part, you might ask? Well, apparently, it's the meal planning. A new survey from Kerry Gold found that nearly 90% of Americans find the process to be more anxiety producing 
than decorating. Even more stressful than getting your kids to sit on Santa's lap for a photo. One major source of stress is cooking for those on specific diets, from gluten to dairy-free to vegetarian or keto. Crystal, what would you find to be more stressful, decorating or cooking for the holidays? I would say the gifts. Find gifts? gifts for people, you know Ooh. what I mean? Like, cause some people want the gifts, some people don't. But luckily, I'm a Louisiana girl, so we eat pretty much everything. Okay. I, I mean, I don't know if you don't want to eat something, just don't eat it. That's just, my. That's there my it is, exactly. I, I'm under the impression <laughs> yeah. it's going to be a little bit more difficult for those that are hosting uh, yeah. for those diets, nope. you know, if if you will. Uh, thankfully, I, I don't cook. We all know that's not a surprise. <laughs> I, I don't cook. I don't know how to cook, so uh, I'll stick to decorating this. Well, you have an season. air fryer, so there you go. So, <laughs> and go. that's your morning consumer news. The time now is 5:10 Eastern and 4:10. Hey, it's time to check in on meteorologist Nicole Phillips for a look at your weather right now. Good morning to you, Nicole. And good morning. So we've got some areas of fog. Actually, we've got some dense fog. So dense fog advisory through this morning. How long this will last? Plus, we've got to talk about some storms in the forecast for the first half of the weekend. That's all coming up after the break. Hey, don't forget to download the weather app. Turn on the notifications so you can stay connected. On your side, meteorologist Nicole Phillips has your first alert forecast. Well, good Thursday morning. Surprise, surprise. We are dealing with fog once again. So here's a look at our dense fog advisory through 9 a.m. Central Time, 10 a.m. Eastern for the county shaded in gray here. When we look at what we uh, can tell here, where it's the most dense, you can see that we've got visibility less than a mile out towards uh, Lumpkin, even down towards Cuthbert about a mile. And then extending this out here, most of us are dealing with some dense fog this morning. So you're going to need to allow yourself some extra time because it looks exactly like this. And in some spots it looks even worse than that. Temperatures this morning sitting in the 30s and 40s. We've got 32 degrees up in the Grange, 41 in Americus, and 37 in Fort Gaines. Other than the fog that we have this morning, it's pretty calm out there. And honestly, today will be a calm day. It's going to be one of our transition days into our next pattern that will come in on Friday and also on Saturday. Our next storm system out here in the Mountain West, that's what's going to give us that chance for some thunderstorms by Saturday. So looking at the rest of today, we'll see an increase of clouds as we go throughout most of today. Notice by 5 p.m. we start to see a little bit of rain off towards our southwest. That will be moving in as we head towards about 10 p.m., moving off towards the northeast. And honestly, that's just going to kind of kickstart what we've got going on for Friday as well. So Friday we are going to see a little bit more in terms of showers around compared to 
really today. Here's a look at what we can expect today. 55 degrees by noon, 65 degrees by 4 p.m. Now, that system I was talking to you about out west, now it will start to move east by Friday, causing severe weather in portions of uh, Mississippi, over to Arkansas, Louisiana, into Tennessee, and that will shift towards the east. As of right now, we have a marginal risk, so this is a level one out of five for Saturday. So what's happening is, is that on Friday, we'll have the chance for a few showers as a warm front lifts towards the north. You're going to notice it's going to feel significantly different on Friday compared to today. It'll be about 10 degrees warmer on Friday with temperatures in the middle 70s. We'll have an increased uh, moisture in the atmosphere, so it'll feel a little bit muggy as well. That warm front continues to lift north. We'll continue with that chance for showers even as we go into about Saturday morning. Then here we go. Saturday afternoon, we start to see some thunderstorms forming along and out ahead of the cold front. The actual front starts to move in by Saturday evening, and some of the storms here could be strong to even severe. So that is one of the reasons why we are weather aware on Saturday. So 75 degrees on Friday because of that warm front. 71 on Saturday. Then after that front passes through, temperatures in the 50s will warm right on back up by the middle of next week, 70 degrees on Wednesday. All righty. Thank you, Nicole. Well, on Friday, the Carver Tigers will try to win their first state championship since 2007. It's been a long, hard road to get here, but the Tigers are ready to win. Rex Castillo has more. After 14 long years, the Carver Tigers are heading to Atlanta to fight for a state championship. Now, the last time the Tigers made it this far, Del McGee led the charge, and Carver brought home a state championship to the Fountain City. Fast forward to 2021, it's Corey Joyner in his fourth season as Carver's head coach, who's led the Tigers this far. Every year since Coach Joyner and his staff arrived on campus, the Tigers have gone further and further in the playoffs. That also translates to his team seniors. They've been through massive tests, like a double overtime game against Cairo in 2019. In their season opener this year, they played 6A powerhouse Lee County. This postseason, they've had to come back in every game for a win. Now, Carver understands the magnitude of Friday's title game, and they all want to finish the mission. It's important for the city, it's important for our school as well. So, you know, and it's important for us because we have put the work in. And we, we're not just a team that's been working one year, we're a team that's been working for four years for this project. I'll say this is a great one of the great accomplishments that I really want to accomplish like ever since my freshman year and it would be a great way to end my high school career. I mean it been hard, a lot of hard work been put in, a lot of teamwork been in. I mean we just stood together as a team, played as one on Friday night. Carver squares off against Benedictine on Friday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. for the Class 4A state title. Sticking with college ball, the Crimson Tide will send Bryce Young to New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony, but teammates believe there should have been one more player sent. Sophomore linebacker Will Anderson leads the country in sacks with 15 and a half and was not named a Heisman finalist. However, Michigan defensive lineman Aiden Hutchinson, who is second in that category, will head to New York for the ceremony. Anderson says he has nothing to prove, but his teammates have his back. I have nothing to prove to anybody. It's all what I do. Nobody expectations higher for me. Nobody standards going to be higher for me. It's all about what I do and the expectation I have for myself. So I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing this whole season. I definitely think he was deserving. If you look at, you know, you look at numbers, you look at the production. Um, I definitely think he deserves to be there. Um, you know, it's it's unfortunate that he's not going to be able to be there. You know, that, that really sucks. But I definitely think he should be there. The Heisman Trophy ceremony will take place on December 11th. That'll do it for your morning sports. Let's send it back to you. All right, so the time now is 518 Eastern and 418 Central. And coming up, Instagram is in the hot water as lawmakers grill the social media giant on the app's ability to keep teen users safe. And here's a look at your winning lottery numbers today. News 3 is your official Georgia lottery station. Hurt my big truck. 1-800-CALL-KEN. One call, that's all.
other side. You're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. Taking a look at Washington this morning, it's also where Instagram CEO recently testified on the platform's potential impact on teens' mental health. Well, Instagram says it's stepping up efforts to keep teens safe, but some lawmakers say those measures aren't enough. Anna Warnicke has more. Our nation is in the midst of a teen mental health crisis. Connecticut Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal says data released this week by the U.S. Surgeon General shows hospitalizations from suicide attempts among teens rose 51 percent during the pandemic, and more teens are battling anxiety and depression. Big tech actually uh, fans those flames. Blumenthal blamed Instagram's CEO Adam Mosseri on Wednesday for knowing the negative effects Instagram has on the mental health of young people and not doing anything about it. Mosseri says Instagram plans to roll out new parental control features this March, including notifying parents if their child reports someone in the app and allowing parents to set time limits. The parent knows best what's best for their teen, so the appropriate amount of time should be a decision by a parent about the specific teen. But Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn wasn't convinced. Telling teens to take a break might seem helpful on the face of things. It's probably not going to get most teenagers to stop doing what they're doing. Self-policing depends on trust. The trust is gone. Senators Blackburn and Blumenthal say the solutions Instagram has introduced are not enough. They plan to introduce a bill to hold big tech companies accountable through independent oversight. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. And now it's time for your weather on the three at News 3. And meteorologist Nicole Phillips is here for your Thursday forecast. Hey, good morning, Nicole. Hey, good morning. 23 minutes past the hour. We're dealing with fog this morning. That's going to slow you down, unfortunately, and most of us are dealing with it. So be careful. Allow yourself some extra time. Temperatures are pretty chilly. 36 degrees up in Smith Station, 38 in Lafayette, 41 degrees in Cuthbert this morning, 32 out in LaGrange. So your school day outlook, dense fog this morning. Then we're going to see an increase of clouds today. 65 degrees for the ride home. We've got temperatures in the middle 70s for Friday. Seven day forecast coming up in 20 minutes. All righty. Thank you so much, Nicole. And right now we're following a number of other big stories for you this morning. Well, keeping an eye on the world, rainbow flags fill the air as a crowd in Chile celebrates same sex marriage being legalized. Chile's Senate and lower house of parliament both voted in favor of the bill Tuesday. It had been partially approved in November before the Senate sent it back to a committee to clarify it. And the country's current president has backed the bill and is expected to sign it into law. And keeping an eye on America today, late Senator Bob Dole's casket will lie in the state in the U.S. Capitol. The former Republican presidential candidate and World War II veteran served in Congress for 36 years. In February, Dole announced that he had stage four lung cancer. He died Sunday at the age of 98. And keeping an eye on the South, authorities say a terrible nightmare was avoided after a student was found with drugs and an AK-47 pistol aboard a Northeastern High School bus in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Authorities say the school bus driver took action after smelling marijuana on board Wednesday morning. The student in question is now in custody and facing multiple charges. Police say right now there's no evidence the student plan on using the gun. And keeping an eye on Alabama, the Salvation Army of Columbus received a grant from the Russell County Coronavirus Response Fund, and now that money is being used to help those who might be behind on rent due to the pandemic. Renters can apply Monday through Thursday by swinging by the Salvation Army Second Ave location in Columbus and filling out an application. Once the application is complete, a caseworker will meet one on one with the renter to determine the financial assistance needed up to $1,000. Take a listen. It is a challenging time, but we always have our doors open and we try to assist as many clients as we possibly can. Uh, we can't help everyone, but we help as many as we can. The Salvation Army says the grant only applies to Russell County residents and will run until January of 2022 or while supplies last. And keeping an eye on Georgia, new district lines have been approved by the Columbus Redistricting Commission. Ten different maps were considered based on the 2020 census data. Now, the ultimate goal was to draw each district so that population and demographic 
demographic numbers fell within a target range, all while trying to keep neighborhoods intact. Now, based on that, counselors voted 15 to 1 to approve Map J. And next, the Georgia Legislative and Congressional Reapportionment Office and the Columbus City Council must approve the new map. More information about the districts, including an interactive map showing how the change will affect your area, is available online at WRBL.com. Coming up this hour, the car of a missing Auburn University student has been found. What was inside, plus what new questions are here in the 45-year-old cold case. And next, a former officer says she mistakenly drew a gun and set up a taser when she killed a man at a traffic stop. The latest from that trial, straight ahead. Plus, possible relief in the fight against COVID-19. How a familiar weapon could stop the spread of that new strain. All that and more when we come back. On your side, you're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. We begin in Troop County where a 45-year-old cold case has been thrown wide open after a missing Auburn University student's car has been found with human remains inside. Our News 3's Amanda Peralta has that story. 22-year-old Kyle Klinkscales vanished into thin air on the night of January 27, 1976. He was a LaGrange native who was studying at Auburn University and working at the Moose Club, a lounge off Old Airport Road in LaGrange. Klinkscales disappeared that Friday night, leaving few clues and little hope behind him. 45 years later, his car, a white two-door 1974 Pinto runabout with a Georgia tag, his wallet, and human remains believed to be his, were found in Chambers County, Alabama, off County Road 83. We retrieved the vehicle out of the creek, uh, was able to tell that it had a Troop County tag on it. Once we were able to tell that Troop County tag was on it, I then reached out to Captain Nathan Taylor, gave him the tag number and the VIN number, to attempt to try to find the information on this tag. Klingscale's parents spent years searching for their only son and even wrote a book titled Kyle's Story, Friday Never Came, The Search for Missing People and created a nonprofit missing person organization, Find Me, Inc. Officials say his mother's biggest wish was to find her son before she passed away. His mother, Louise, passed away this past January. Hopefully we'll find something we may never know. But we are glad today, you know, Ms. Klingscale, his mother, died just this year in January. And it was always her hope that he would come home. It was always our hope that we would find him for her before she passed away. So just the, the fact that we have hopefully found him and the car 
brings me a big sigh of relief. The car was transported to the Troop County Sheriff's Office, where the GBI will be investigating the contents of the car. This is the creek where officials located Clio Kangstill's car, leaving them searching for answers regarding his disappearance. Reporting in Chambers County, Amanda Peralta, WRBL News 3, on your side. Now, previous reporting indicates two people, Jimmy Jones and Jan Johnson, were later arrested on various charges connected with Klinskell's disappearance. Those charges include concealing a death and making false statements. For more details about this decades long investigation, you'll find them on our website, WRBL.com. Well, in Muskogee County, a man arrested on felony theft charges is now the suspect in an Alabama homicide. 19 year old Solomon Cooper of Climax, Georgia, has been in the Muskogee County Jail since November the 15th. And according to police, recent developments now ties him to an unrelated case, the murder of 20-year-old Sincere Tyson. Now, Tyson was shot in his Dothan home while he was sleeping nearly two months ago on October the 9th. Police say evidence points Cooper to this crime, and he is now charged with capital murder. Authorities say once the unrelated theft charges are addressed in Georgia, Cooper will be extradited to Alabama and held without bond. Also in Alabama, a driver is facing charges after police say he sped towards a parade full of families in Hayden. The parents pulled their children away as a car sped through the annual parade Tuesday night. According to Hayden Police Chief James Chapman, Tony Nix ignored flashing blue lights as he got closer to the crowd. Investigators say Nix was parked along the already blocked parade route when at some point he drove forward. Our police officers were, had tried to stop him at the intersection. I put my car in park and I jumped out chasing the car. And uh, the band members that were behind my car, uh, they were jumping and scattering out of the way. We, we were very fortunate that nobody got hurt. And according to court documents, Nix is accused of flipping off officers. He also tells officers that he didn't know they were trying to stop him. Charges have been filed and more are expected as this investigation continues. And you're watching News 2 this morning, and here's Nicole with your morning commute forecast. Hey, good morning. So, 33 minutes past the hour. The biggest story that we have this morning will be the fog. So, giving it a level four here. This is a high impact for our morning because the fog is very dense. You can't see out ahead of you. So, just allow yourself some extra time. Temperatures are chilly this morning with low 30s to low 40s. Here is a look at that Phoenix City amphitheater. You can see the fog out there. So, red light this morning. Things will improve by mid morning. 55 degrees by lunchtime. In the middle 60s today with increasing clouds. We're in the middle 70s on Friday. Your Friday forecast coming up in 10 minutes. All righty, thanks, Nicole. Well, the U.S. passed a key milestone in its vaccination effort, but health experts say there is still more work to be done against the pandemic. Laura Podesta reports. More than 200 million, or just over 60 percent of Americans, are now fully vaccinated against COVID 19. It feels good to be safer. Many are now getting their booster shot. A key defense against the Omicron variant. At first, we were skeptical about do we need it or not, but once we were, there's another variant out there. There's no taking chances. Pfizer says its additional shot increases protection 25 fold against Omicron. That will induce immunity that is likely to protect from infection, symptomatic illness, and severe disease. Only about a quarter of eligible Americans have had a booster. Meanwhile, COVID hospitalizations jumped nearly 30% in the past month, driven by the Delta variant. Unless we really double down on what we're doing, we could see an increased spike that goes even higher than that as we get deeper into December and January. Four states, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, are responsible for around half of the increase in hospitalizations. Michigan hit a record number this week. Nearly all who are on the intensive care unit are unvaccinated, especially those who are have a tube down their throat or are intubated. A new report by the Nuclear Threat Initiative and Johns Hopkins University found the world is dangerously unprepared for future pandemics. The U.S.'s score was hurt by a lack of public trust in government. Laura Podesta, CBS News. Hey, we want to remind you the Department of Public Health is hosting mobile vaccine clinics this week. Today, they'll be at the Elizabeth Canty Homes on Casita Road from 1 to 4. There, you can get the COVID 19 vaccine or a flu shot. Registration is preferred but not required. Again, for a full list of these locations, you'll find them on our website, WRBL.com. And we thank you for trusting News 3 this morning as your favorite source right when you wake up. Coming up, Kristen Bell unravels as she spies on her neighbors in a new comedy. We'll break it all down for you in your first look when we come back.
on your side. This is News 3 This Morning. While the thin line between love and hate explodes in movie theaters this weekend. And Krista Bell stars in a new Netflix series. Anthony Pura has your Today's Eye on Entertainment. I'm trapped here day after endless day. The popular romance novel, The Hating Game by Sally Thorne, is hitting the big screen. Put that donut hole away or I'm going to shove it up your. It's about two co workers whose disdain for each other hides true love. Lucy Hale and Austin Stowell are familiar co stars, also appearing together in the 2020 film Fantasy Island. I think that was the joy of doing this movie with someone I knew, is because the only thing that's going to fully sell this movie, especially from a book that's loved by so many because of that chemistry, like that chemistry has to be there. Netflix has released a trailer for a new dark comedic psychological thriller. Titled The Woman in the House Across the Street from the Girl in the Window, it stars Kristen Bell, who plays a woman questioning reality after believing she witnessed a murder in her neighborhood. I just feel like I'm falling apart, like a house of cards. Bell also executive produces the limited series, dropping on Netflix January 28th. And on tonight's episode of the CBS original series Ghosts, Hetty accidentally possesses Jay's body at the worst possible time. <laughs> Right before a well known wedding planner is going to stop by. The show also streams live and on demand on Paramount Plus. That's your eye on entertainment. Anthony Pura, CBS News, Los Angeles. And time now to check in with meteorologist Nicole Phillips for she's keeping her eye on Columbus. Nicole, a lot of fog out there. You want to make sure you give yourself extra time as you hit the road this morning. Yeah, so here is a look at uh, current visibility out at Phoenix City Amphitheater. It's dense. We'll forecast after the break. On your side, you're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. Education this morning's Kinetic Credit Union Golden Apple Award honoree is a hardworking math teacher from Fort Middle School here in Columbus. Meet Sierra Brooks. She accepted her Golden Apple from News 3's Carlos Williams and Kinetic Credit Union's Clint Perkins. She was nominated by Jennifer Thomas, who says her son went from doubting his smarts to making the honor roll. All thanks to Miss Brooks. I had the privilege of teaching him last year when we were hybrid. Um, he was one of the students who came in. He was eager to learn. So I am very grateful to know that I am having a lasting impression on my students. 
Congratulations again to Ms. Brooks. Of course, if you know a deserving teacher, you can nominate them by going to our website, WRBL.com, and filling out the nomination form. On your side, meteorologist Nicole Phillips has your first alert forecast. Good Thursday morning, 43 minutes past the hour. We've got some fog to talk about this morning. So dense fog advisory through 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern. For the county, shaded in gray here, and this is why extremely dense fog. That's going to slow you down this morning, and we're even seeing that here on Phoenix City Amphitheater. Notice we really can't see out ahead. So this morning, that's going to be the issue. Temperatures are on the chilly side. And the low 30s up towards the north, 32 degrees up in the Grange, but 39 in Americas and 41 degrees in Ufaw. So here's a look at our satellite and radar calm this morning, other than the fog that we have. And honestly, today we'll stay calm as we look at our radar forecast. The only thing we're really going to notice is that when we get rid of the fog, we'll see a little bit, just a little bit of sun and then increasing clouds as we go throughout the day. Now there is a band of showers that will be moving through mainly after about 5 to 6 p.m. here. Right around 10 p.m. we'll start to see some rain moving on in. That will lift up towards the north and that's just going to kickstart the active pattern that we'll have so off and on chances for some showers as we go into Friday and then the next system coming in on Saturday. So 55 degrees by noon, 65 degrees by 4 p.m. Temperatures today getting into the low to middle 60s. So yes, we do warm up a little bit more. Uh, tend to get a little bit above average for this time of the year. Notice how our temperatures continue to go up and down, but we're going to notice some big changes on Friday. So the system that will be moving in on Saturday is going to cause some severe weather off towards our west on Friday. That will shift down towards the east and southeast as we go into Saturday. As of right now, we have have a level one out of five, so a marginal risk for severe weather for most of the area. And again, this is still a few days away, so that all could change. So here's the setup. By Friday morning, a warm front will lift up towards the north, so we'll have that chance for a few showers, so grab the umbrella. But for the afternoon, you're going to notice it will feel warmer, and it may even feel a little bit muggy because we do have that warm front that has lifted towards the north. So what's happened is it's allowed the warm air to come in, but also allowing a little bit more moisture from the Gulf of Mexico to come in as well. On Saturday, we'll be tracking a cold front that will bring a few showers and thunderstorms out ahead of it, but also along the front that will come through as we go into Saturday afternoon and into the evening. So this is why we are weather aware, because we could see some strong to even severe storms along that front. So 65 today, 75 degrees on Friday because of that warm front, then 71 degrees on Saturday. Again, we are weather aware. Temperatures behind the front are in the 50s, but they won't be in the 50s for long. We'll be in the upper 60s on Tuesday with sunny skies, and then 70 degrees on Wednesday. All righty, thank you so much, Nicole. Relief is on the way for folks facing eviction in Russell County this holiday season. The Salvation Army of Columbus just received a grant from the Russell County Coronavirus Response Fund, and now that money is being used to help those who might be behind on rent due to the pandemic. Renters can apply Monday through Thursday by swinging by the Salvation Army 2nd Ave location in Columbus and filling out an application form. Once the application is complete, a caseworker will meet with the renter one on one to determine the financial assistance needed up to $1,000. It's always been very important for us to help Russell County residents. Um, they are our neighbors and friends, and it's when we get money, we would like to make sure that we are able to assist them. The grant only applies to Russell County residents and will run until January of 2022 or while supplies last. We thank you for trusting News 3 this morning. Coming up, a 26 year old police veteran says it was an accident when she fatally shot a man during a traffic stop. We'll dive into this ongoing trial when we come back.
on your side. You're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. Well, opening statements followed by testimony in the trial of Kim Potter, the former Minnesota police officer, says she mistakenly drew a gun when she shot and killed 20 year old Dante Wright. Laura Podesta has the latest. In the same courtroom where former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty of murdering George Floyd, another white officer, Kim Potter, sits trial connected to the death of a black man named Dante Wright. In April, police pulled over 20-year-old Wright for expired license plate tags and an air freshener hanging from his rearview mirror, which is illegal in Minnesota. They then discovered he had an outstanding warrant. <laughs> Video from Potter's body cam shows police attempting to arrest Wright before he gets back in his car. Potter then pulls out her pistol while repeatedly shouting taser. <laughs> She then shoots right in the chest. We trust them to know wrong from right and left from right. The defense claimed in opening statements Potter mistakenly grabbed the wrong weapon while trying to protect another officer who would have gotten hurt had Wright driven away. This was an accident. She's a human being, but she had to do what she had to do to prevent. A death to a fellow officer, too. Wright's mother spoke to the court about the pain that accident has created. I wanted to go comfort my baby. I wanted to hold him. Potter's expected to testify on her own behalf next week. Laura Podesta, CBS News. Now, meanwhile, Potter is no longer on the Brooklyn Center police force. The 26 year veteran resigned shortly after that shooting. Blake? Thank you, Crystal. Over in hell, thousands of Americans say they're suffering from long term COVID. It's a problem that's prompting healthcare workers across the U.S. to create new comprehensive treatment programs. Dr. Malika Marshall reports. Didn't really understand. In March 2020, 47 year old Phil Bezeski developed fever, a cough, and trouble breathing. When the 47 year old father of four went to the hospital, the doctor didn't mince words. He said, You're really sick. And if we don't put you on life support, you're going to die. Phil had COVID-19, was in pulmonary failure, and given a 10% chance to live. He spent 28 days in the hospital, 16 of them in a coma. From when I woke up till the day I left, I mean, it was, it was a struggle to even just use my hands to feed myself. More than a year later, Phil still suffers from nerve pain, weakness, fatigue, shortness of breath, anxiety, depression, and brain fog. It's another pandemic. And it threatens the health of a generation. Dr. Bruce Levy at Brigham and Women's Hospital says up to 30% of patients with COVID, many with only mild illness, have at least one symptom that persists for three to six months or more, a condition referred to as long COVID. Long COVID involves multiple parts of the body, multiple symptoms. And so going to any one doctor is a real challenge to comprehensively evaluate this. That's why the hospital established a COVID recovery center where patients have their lingering symptoms addressed all in one place. They get a, an itinerary for any uh, doctors or other care, health care providers they'll be seeing. Phil has been coming to the center for a few months. It's provided me with some hope for the future that, you know, this is what I've been longing for from services to have someone that really can understand COVID. He hopes more long COVID patients can also find the help they need. Dr. Malika Marshall, CBS News, Boston. And here at News 3, we're always on your side. Meteorologist Nicole Phillips joins us now with what you need to know. Before you go, you'll want to give yourself some time. Nicole, that, that fog is thick this morning. Goodness gracious, it was, I couldn't see anything. Yes, it's very thick. So it's a high impact morning for us in terms of our morning commute because we've got the dense fog. So here's a look at current visibility. Notice most of us, uh, we don't have a lot of it. Temperatures are sitting in the 30s to even low 40s this morning. So when we look at our day planner, fog will be the big issue for us this morning. Then we'll see an increase of clouds though as we go throughout the rest of today. Temperatures in the middle 60s, so warmer uh, compared to the last couple of days. Now we'll be in the 70s on Friday. I'll have your seven day forecast after the top 10.
All right, thank you, Nicole. And here are the top 10 stories that you need to know about before you leave the house this morning. All righty, number 10, our Holiday Heroes campaign continues next Wednesday, December 15th. Our News 3 team will be at the McDonald's on Macon Road in Columbus, accepting your generous donations of new or gently used blankets, winter coats, hats, gloves, and shoes. We certainly hope to see you there. And number 9, International Women's Month is coming up in March, and WRBL is recognizing the remarkable women in our community. Nominees are being accepted now through December the 31st. Head to our website to fill out that nomination form. Number eight, congrats to this morning's Golden Apple Award winner, Sierra Brooks. She teaches math at Fort Middle School in Columbus. Jennifer Thomas says Ms. Brooks helped her son love school and improve his grades. Of course, you can nominate a deserving teacher like Ms. Brooks on our website, WRBL.com. And number seven, doctors are urging unvaccinated pregnant women to consider getting the COVID-19 vaccine. They say the virus causes complications, which puts both mama and baby at risk. The doctors say some of their unvaccinated patients develop severe illness from COVID-19. And number six, Pfizer says its booster shot increases protection against the Omicron variant by 25%. This comes as COVID 19 hospitalizations jump across the country. Health leaders say the majority of new cases are still from that Delta variant. At number five, the Department of Public Health is hosting mobile vaccine clinics this week. Today, they'll be at the Elizabeth Canty Homes on Casita Road from 1 until 4 p.m. There, you can get the COVID-19 vaccine or a flu shot. Registration is preferred but not required. And for a full list of locations, head to our website. Number four, the Russell County Coronavirus Response Fund is granting the Salvation Army of Columbus money to help those behind on rent. You can apply by visiting the Salvation Army Second App location and filling out an application. The Salvation Army says the grant only applies to Russell County residents and will run until January or while supplies last. And number three, Columbus police are searching for a missing man for over a month now. They say the 31 year old Javier Alexandro Hernandez was last seen November the 4th on Young Avenue in Columbus. Now he's five foot one and weighs about 170 pounds. Police say he also has a sleeve tattoo. Please call CPD if you know where he may be. And number two, a man in the Muskogee County Jail on theft charges will soon be extradited to Alabama to face an unrelated murder charge. Dothan police say 19 year old Solomon Cooper is charged with capital. Capital murder following the deadly shooting of 20 year old Sincere Tyson in October. Once in Dothan, Cooper will be held without bond. At number one, a 44 year old cold case is back open after a victim's car and unidentified remains were found in Casita. Troop County Sheriff James Woodruff confirms the car belongs to Kyle Klinkscale, who was 22 when he went missing back in 1976. Now, two people, Jimmy Jones and Gene Johnson, were previously arrested in that case. And those are your top 10 stories. And of course, meteorologist Nicole Phillips is on top of your final forecast this hour. Hey, Nicole. Hey, good morning. So, we're dealing with some dense fog this morning that's going to slow you down. Then, increasing clouds today. 75 degrees on Friday. We are weather aware on Saturday for the chance for some strong storms along a cold front. We're in the 50s behind that front. And now it's time to announce our next winner of our coffee mug contest. And today's winner is Deborah Peters. Congratulations. We want to thank our morning mug sponsors, Wild Superfast Internet and Wild Animal Safari. And you can pick up your coffee mug at our News 3 studio at the address you see on your screen. And don't forget, you can be, you got to be in it to win it. So head to our website, WRBL.com, to enter into the contest. We thank you for trusting News 3 this morning. We still got one more hour to go. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back.
Time now for your forecast first. WRBL News 3 First Alert Weather. Well, good Thursday morning. We are dealing with some dense fog. We'll talk about it coming up in three minutes. All right, thank you, Nicole. Straight ahead, a missing Auburn University student's car is found reopening a 45 year old cold case. What was found inside, plus what investigators are hoping to learn next. And coming up, health experts say some pregnant women are not getting vaccinated. How they say the lack of protection puts both mother and baby at risk. Plus, relief is on the way for folks in East Alabama who could be facing eviction. Details as News 3 this morning starts right now. On your side, this is News 3 this morning. Well, good morning to you. You're waking up to December 9th, 2021, just one day away from Friday. Can you believe it? I'm Blake Eason. And I'm Crystal Whitman, and thank you for watching News 3 this morning. And we begin in Troop County surrounding new details and a 45 year old cold case after a missing Auburn University student's car was found with human remains inside. Investigators say on January the 27th, 1976, 22 year old Kyle Klingscale left from the Moose Club in LaGrange to drive back to Auburn University, but he never arrived. Now, this week, the Troop County Sheriff's Office confirmed his white two door car was found in a Chambers County Creek. Authorities say skeletal remains were inside, and at this time, Troop County investigators cannot confirm if they are Klingscale's remains. The GBI is working to identify them. Hopefully, we'll find something we may never know, but we are glad today. You know, Ms. Klingscale, his mother, died just this year in January. And it was always her hope that he would come home. It was always our hope that we would find him for her before she passed away. So just the, the fact that we have hopefully found him and the car brings me a big sigh of relief. Now, previous reporting indicates two people, Jimmy Jones and Gene Johnson, were arrested on various charges connecting with Clint Gale's disappearance. Those charges include concealing a death and making false statements. Now, for more details about the decades-long investigation, head to our website. That's WRBL.com. And back in Muskogee County, a man arrested on felony theft charges is now the suspect in an Alabama homicide. 19 year old Solomon Cooper of Climax, Georgia, has been in the Muskogee County Jail since November 15th. Now, according to police, recent developments now tie him to an unrelated case the murder of 20 year old Sincere Tyson. Tyson was shot in his Dothan home while he was sleeping nearly two months ago, back on October 9th. Police say evidence points Cooper to this crime, and he is now charged with capital murder. Authorities say once the unrelated theft charges are addressed in Georgia, Cooper will then be extradited to Alabama and held without bond. And also in Alabama, a driver is facing charges after police say he sped towards a parade full of families in Hayden. Parents pulled their children away as a car sped through the annual parade on Tuesday night. Now, according to Hayden Police Chief James Chapman, Tony Nix ignored flashing blue lights as he got closer to the crowd. Investigators say Nix was parked along the already blocked parade route when at some point he drove forward. Take a listen. Our police officers were, had tried to stop him at the intersection. I put my car in park and I jumped out chasing the car. And uh, the band members that were behind my car, uh, they were jumping and scattering out of the way. We, we were very fortunate that nobody got hurt. And according to court documents, Nix is accused of flipping off an officer. He tells officers that he didn't know they were trying to stop him. Charges have been filed and more are expected as this investigation it continues. And it's great to have you here with us on News 3. Meteorologist Nicole Phillips joins us now with a wake-up forecast to get you rolling this morning. But you don't want to roll too fast because that fog will slow you down. Hey, Nicole. Oh, yes, it's going to slow you down. You know, in fact, I got off the highway and I got in and I was like, oh, it's not bad. But then when I got right in front of the station here, I was like, oh, this is pretty bad. So yes, it, this dense fog advisory that we have through at least 10 a.m. Eastern time, it doesn't surprise me at all. When you look at the current visibility, I mean, it's a struggle for some of us to see out a mile ahead of us. So this is what it looks like out at Phoenix City Amphitheater, and this is what it looks like in most neighborhoods this morning. So when we look at our satellite and radar, it's calm. Temperatures are sitting in the 30s to 40s. So yes, it's chilly as well. Honestly, today will be a calm day. The only issue that we have will be this morning morning with the dense fog. We're warming up to the middle 50s by noon, then into the middle 60s by the afternoon, early evening. Now on Friday, things will change. We'll be back into the 70s, but we are going to add in a chance for showers and then a chance for storms on Saturday. I'll time it all out for you coming up in 10 minutes.
All righty, thank you, Nicole. Turning now to the fight against COVID-19, where it appears we may have a familiar tool to fight that newly discovered Omicron variant. So more than 200 million Americans are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. And now many are turning to booster shots to protect themselves against the Omicron variant. In recently announced findings, Pfizer says its additional shot increases protection against the new variant by 25%. Take a listen. That will induce immunity that is likely to protect from infection, symptomatic illness, and severe disease. Now, only about a quarter of eligible Americans have had a booster. Meanwhile, COVID-19 hospitalizations jumped nearly 30 percent in the past month. Health officials say that's still driven by that Delta variant. I knew this morning doctors are sounding the alarm about the low number of pregnant people getting vaccinated. Now, right now, the number of unvaccinated Pregnant women stands at about 30 percent, according to health officials. Getting vaccinated while pregnant is not only good for mom, but baby as well. Dr. Brown and Khan says in the last two months she's seen new complications for unvaccinated pregnant women who develop COVID. In five cases, the unborn babies were very sick. Expectant mothers also noticed their babies were moving less or not at all. Pregnant women have a higher risk of getting severe illness. They're not getting enough oxygen from the placenta. Most women with COVID don't have this severe manifestation. Um, but those babies that we have seen have been quite ill and have had to be delivered prematurely because they look so sick. Now, health experts emphasize that this is rare, but it is new and it is alarming. And they also add that not, it's not a complication that's seen in vaccinated patients. And we thank you so much for trusting WRBL News 3 this morning as your favorite source right when you wake up. Well, coming up, President Biden signs a new executive order committing the U.S. to clean energy. We'll break it all down for you straight ahead. But first, here's meteorologist Nicole Phillips for a quick look at your Thursday weather. Not a bad day, but some fog right now, Nicole. Yeah, and that's going to slow you down. 55 degrees by noon, then into the 60s by 4 p.m. Your seven-day forecast coming up 13 minutes past the hour. News 3 is on your side. With Crystal Whitman, Blake Eason, and meteorologist Nicole Phillips has your first alert forecast. On your side, you're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. Well, welcome back to News 3 this morning. The federal government plans to cut its carbon emissions by 65% by the end of the decade. President Joe Biden's executive order signed yesterday set the goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. The White House plans to spend billions on a fleet of electric vehicles and upgrade federal buildings with more clean energy. And with the stalemate between cereal maker Kellogg and its striking plant workers, the company now says it plans to permanently replace the 1,400 union members after they rejected a new contract. Workers had hoped for higher wages and enhanced benefits, but the company says it has no plans to meet with the union. And the hardest part of the holidays, you might ask? Well, apparently, it's the meal planning. A new survey from Kerry Gold found that nearly 90% of Americans find the process to be more anxiety producing than decorating, even more stressful than getting your kids to sit on Santa's lap for a photo. 
One major source of stress for cooking is those on who are on specific diets, from gluten and dairy-free to vegetarian or keto. Crystal, I appreciate your honesty, so I'm going to put you on the spot really quickly. Do you mm -hmm. think it's fair to show up at someone's holiday party with your specific diet and expect for them to cater to it, or is that just part of it? You just you have to go by their menu, or should they cater to your specific needs I think if they're going to your place yeah I think it's a little bit of a compromise um, it's a compromise on your end as well as their okay. the other part you have to think about other people that Fair are enough. involved there so maybe also take a dish that you like to that party maybe that's a compromise for you so that's an idea I like that I like that <laughs> a, a good meat in the middle there you have it folks absolutely and that's your morning consumer news the time now is 6 10 Eastern and 5 10 Central and time to check in with meteorologist Nicole Phillips for a look at your weather right now good morning Nicole and good morning. So we've got a dense fog advisory this morning because we're seeing some very dense fog. How long this will last plus our seven day forecast coming up after the break. On your side, meteorologist Nicole Phillips has your first alert forecast. Good Thursday morning, 13 minutes past the hour. Dense fog, that is going to be the issue for us this morning. So we've got a dense fog advisory through 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Central Time. And this is why we're seeing the dense fog all across the area. When we look out here at Phoenix City Amphitheater, notice we really can't see out ahead of us. So not only is this here on our, our sky view here from Phoenix City, but it's also in most of the neighborhoods out there. So just allow yourself some extra time. It's chilly with temperatures in the 30s and 40s to start off the day. And other than the fog, it's pretty calm. We've got the high pressure that's sitting over us, but our next system will start to come in as we go into Friday and also Saturday. So looking at our radar forecast, other than the fog that we have this morning, we'll get the fog out of here, then we'll see an increase of clouds. A chance for a few showers later on tonight, right around the 9 to 10 p.m. time frame. And we see that here on our radar forecast. That will lift up towards the northeast, and then we'll be left with that chance for off and on showers overnight and into early Friday morning. So 55 degrees by noon, 65 degrees by 4 p.m. So honestly, our temperatures today just a little bit warmer compared to 24 hours ago where we were in the low 60s. Today we'll be in the middle 60s, so starting to warm on up. But again, we're going to get even warmer on Friday. So the system that I'm watching closely is actually going to be moving east today. By Friday, giving the chance for severe weather in portions of Tennessee into Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Then that will shift down towards the east and southeast as we go into Saturday. So as of right now, we have a level one, so this is a marginal risk out of five. And really what we're watching here are for some gusty winds along and out ahead 
ahead of a cold front that will be coming in on Saturday. So let's track here our setup. So Friday morning, we'll have a warm front that will lift up towards the north, and along that front, we could see some showers, maybe some rumbles of thunder. But then notice that we'll keep that chance for showers off and on into the afternoon. One of the big things that you'll notice when you go out on Friday is that it will be warmer. This front lifts up towards the north. Temperatures will be allowed to warm up into the 70s. It will also be a little bit more muggy as well, so it'll feel more like spring compared to fall, almost winter. Now, this is all just setting us up for that chance for some strong to possibly even severe storms on Saturday because we've got all of that moisture and the moisture in our atmosphere is a little bit unstable. So, a few showers and storms forming right around 3 p.m. The actual front coming in by 8 p.m. on Saturday. And again, some strong winds are possible with this at the moment, but we are still a few days away, so this could all change. But we are weather aware on Saturday. So 75 degrees on Friday, 71 on Saturday, in the 50s, Sunday, and Monday. Then we're back into the upper 60s to low 70s wow. by the middle of next week, I know. I am just loving this, Nicole. <laughs> 60s and 70s. Yes. <laughs> well, on Friday, the Carver Tigers will try to win their first state championship since. 2007. It's been a long, hard road to get there, but the Tigers are ready to win. Rex Castillo has more. After 14 long years, the Carver Tigers are heading to Atlanta to fight for a state championship. Now, the last time the Tigers made it this far, Del McGee led the charge, and Carver brought home a state championship to the Fountain City. Fast forward to 2021, it's Corey Joyner in his fourth season as Carver's head coach, who's led the Tigers this far. Every year since Coach Joyner and his staff arrived on campus, the Tigers have gone further and further in the playoffs. That also translates to his team's seniors. They've been through massive tests, like a double overtime game against Cairo in 2019. In their season opener this year, they played 6A powerhouse Lee County. This postseason, they've had to come back in every game for a win. Now, Carver understands the magnitude of Friday's title game, and they all want to finish the mission. It's important for the city, it's important for our school as well. So, you know, and it's important for us because we have put the work in. And we, we're not just a team that's been working one year, we're a team that's been working for four years for this project. I'll say this is a great, one of the great accomplishments that I really want to accomplish, like, ever since my freshman year. And it would be a great way to end my high school career. I mean, it's been hard. A lot of hard work been put in, a lot of teamwork been in. I mean, we just stuck together as a team, played that one on Friday night. Carver squares off against Benedictine on Friday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. for the Class 4A state title. Sticking with college ball, the Crimson Tide will send Bryce Young to New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony, but teammates believe there should have been one more player sent. Sophomore linebacker Will Anderson leads the country in sacks with 15 and a half and was not named a Heisman finalist. However, Michigan defensive lineman Aiden Hutchinson, who is second in that category, will head to New York for the ceremony. Anderson says he has nothing to prove, but his teammates have his back. I have nothing to prove to anybody. It's all what I do. Nobody expectation is higher for me. Nobody standards going to be higher for me. It's all about what I do and the expectation I have for myself. So I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing this whole season. I definitely think he was deserving. If you look at, you know, you look at numbers, you look at the production. Um, I definitely think he deserves to be there. Um, you know, it's it's unfortunate that he's not going to be able to be there. You know, that, that really sucks. But I definitely think he should be there. The Heisman Trophy ceremony will take place on December 11th. That'll do it for your morning sports. Let's send it back to you. And the time now, 618 Eastern and 518 Central. And coming up, Instagram is in the hot water this morning as lawmakers grill the social media giant on the app's ability to keep teen users safe. Hurt by a big truck? 1-800-CALL-KEN. One call, that's all.
on your side. You're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. Well, welcome back to the news through this morning. Taking a live look at our nation's capital over the time now, 621 Eastern, 521 Central. Also, where an Instagram CEO recently testified on the platform's potential impact on teens' mental health. Yeah, Instagram says it's stepping up efforts to keep kids safe, but some lawmakers say those measures are not enough. And a Warnicky has more. Our nation is in the midst of a teen mental health crisis. Connecticut Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal says data released this week by the U.S. Surgeon General shows hospitalizations from suicide attempts among teens rose 51 percent during the pandemic, and more teens are battling anxiety and depression. Big tech actually uh, fans those flames. Blumenthal blamed Instagram's CEO Adam Mosseri on Wednesday for knowing the negative effects Instagram has on the mental health of young people and not doing anything about it. Mosseri says Instagram plans to roll out new parental control features this March, including notifying parents if their child reports someone in the app and allowing parents to set time limits. The parent knows best what's best for their teen, so the appropriate amount of time should be a decision by a parent about the specific teen. But Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn wasn't convinced. Telling teens to take a break might seem helpful on the face of things. It's probably not going to get most teenagers to stop doing what they're doing. Self-policing depends on trust. The trust is gone. Senators Blackburn and Blumenthal say the solutions Instagram has introduced are not enough. They plan to introduce a bill to hold big tech companies accountable through independent oversight. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. And now it's time for your weather on the three. And News 3 and meteorologist Nicole Phillips has the forecast for your Thursday, Friday Eve. Nicole? <laughs> I know we're almost done. 23 minutes past the hour. Hey, looking a little bit better here out at Phoenix City Amphitheater. We can start to see a little bit out, uh, out there. And, and visibility has improved just a little bit. Not much, but hey, we're going to take anything that we can get as of right now because the fog is, is dense. Temperatures are sitting in the 30s and to even low 40s this morning. 42 degrees in Gufala, 38 degrees right here in Columbus. When we look at our school day outlook, we'll see fog this morning, then an increase of clouds as we go into the rest of today. 65 degrees for the ride home. Your seven-day forecast coming up in the next 20 minutes. All righty. Thank you so much, Nicole. And right now we're following a number of other big stories for you this morning. We start by keeping an eye on America, where today late Senator Bob Dole's casket will lie in state in the U.S. Capitol. The former Republican presidential candidate and World War II veteran served in Congress for 36 years. In February, Dole announced that he had stage four lung cancer. He died Sunday at the age of 98. And keeping an eye on Georgia, new district lines have been approved by the Columbus Redistricting Commission. Ten different maps were considered based on the 2020 census data. Now, the ultimate goal was to draw each district so that population and demographic numbers fell within a target range, all while trying to keep neighborhoods intact. Based on that, counselors voted 15 to 1 to approve Map J. And the next Georgia Legislative and Congressional Reapportionment Office and the Columbus Columbus City Council must approve the new map. Now, more for more information about the districts, including an interactive map showing how the change will affect your area, head to our website, WRBL.com. And keeping it out in Alabama, the Salvation Army of Columbus received a grant from the Russell County Coronavirus Response Fund, and now that money is being used to help those who might be behind on rent, all caused by the pandemic. Renters can apply Monday through Thursday by swinging by the Salvation Army 2nd Ave location and filling out an application. Once the application is complete, a caseworker will meet with the renter one-on-one -on -one to determine the financial assistance needed up to $1,000. It's always been very important for us to help Russell County residents. Um, they are our neighbors and friends, and it's when we get money, we would like to make sure that we are able to assist them. The grant only applies to your Russell County residents and will run until January of 2022 or while supplies last. Coming up this hour, the car of a missing Auburn University student has been found. What was inside, plus new questions in this 45-year-old cold case. And next, a former officer says she mistakenly drew a gun instead of a taser when she killed a man at a traffic stop. The latest from that trial and straight ahead. Plus, possible relief in the fight against COVID-19, how a familiar weapon could stop the spread of that new strain.
on your side. You're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. We'll begin this half hour in Troop County where a 45-year-old cold case has been thrown wide open after a missing Auburn University student's car has been found with human remains inside. Our News 3's Amanda Peralta has that story. 22-year-old Kyle Klinkscales vanished into thin air on the night of January 27, 1976. He was a LaGrange native who was studying at Auburn University and working at the Moose Club, a lounge off Old Airport Road in LaGrange. Klinkscales disappeared that Friday night, leaving few clues and little hope behind him. 45 years later, his car, a white two-door 1974 Pinto runabout with a Georgia tag, his wallet, and human remains believed to be his, were found in Chambers County, Alabama, off County Road 83. We retrieved the vehicle out of the creek, uh, was able to tell that it had a Troop County tag on it. Once we were able to tell the Troop County tag was on it, I then reached out to Captain Nathan Taylor, gave him the tag number and the VIN number, to attempt to try to find the information on this tag. Klingscale's parents spent years searching for their only son and even wrote a book titled Kyle's Story Friday Never Came The Search for Missing People and created a nonprofit missing person organization, Find Me Inc. Officials say his mother's biggest wish was to find her son before she passed away. His mother, Louise, passed away this past January. Hopefully, we'll find something we may never know. But we are glad today. You know, Ms. Klingscale, his mother, died just this year in January and it was always her hope that he would come home. It was always our hope that we would find him for her before she passed away. So just the, the fact that we have hopefully found him and the car brings me a big sigh of relief. The car was transported to the Troop County Sheriff's Office where the GBI will be investigating the contents of the car. This is the creek where officials located Clio Kingstill's car, leaving them searching for answers regarding his disappearance. Reporting in Chambers County, Amanda Peralta, WRBL News 3, on your side. Now, previous reporting indicates two people, Jimmy Jones and Jeanne Johnson, were later arrested on various charges connected with Klinkscale's disappearance. Those charges include concealing a death and making false statements. For more details about this decades-long investigation, you'll find them on our website, WRBL.com. Well, in Muskogee County, a man arrested on felony theft charges is now a suspect in an Alabama homicide. 19-year-old Solomon Cooper of Climax, Georgia, has been in the Muskogee County Jail since November the 15th. Now, according to police, recent developments now ties him to an unrelated case, the murder of 20-year-old Sincere Tyson. Tyson was shot in his Dothan home while he was sleeping nearly two months ago on October the 9th. Police say evidence points Cooper to this crime, and he is now charged with capital murder. Authorities say once the the unrelated theft charges are addressed in Georgia. Cooper will be extradited to Alabama and held without bond. Also in Alabama, a driver is facing charges after police say he sped towards a parade full of families over in Hayden. Parents pulled their children away as a car sped through the annual parade Tuesday night. According to Hayden Police Chief James Chapman, Tony Nix ignored flashing blue lights as he got closer to the crowd. Investigators say Nix was parked along the already blocked parade route. When at some point he drove forward, our police officers were, had tried to stop him at the intersection. I put my car in park and I jumped out chasing the car, and uh, the band members that were behind my car, uh, they were jumping and scattering out of the way. We, we were very fortunate that nobody got hurt. And according to court documents, Nix is accused of flipping off an officer. He tells officers that he didn't know they were trying to stop him. Charges have been filed and more are expected as this investigation continues. And the U.S. passed a key milestone in its vaccination effort, but health experts say there's still more work that needs to be done against the pandemic. Laura Podesta reports. More than 200 million, or just over 60% of Americans, are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. It feels good to be safer. Many are now getting their booster shot, a key defense against the Omicron variant. At first we were skeptical about do we need it or not, but once we were there was another variant out there, there's no taking chances. Pfizer says its additional shot increases protection 25-fold against Omicron. That will induce immunity that is likely to protect from infection, symptomatic illness and severe disease. A new report by the Nuclear Threat Initiative and Johns Hopkins University found the world is dangerously unprepared for future pandemics. The U.S.'s score was hurt by a lack of public trust in government.
And we want to remind you the Department of Public Health is hosting mobile vaccine clinics this week. Today they'll be at the Elizabeth Canty Homes on Casita Road from 1 to 4. There you can get the COVID 19 vaccine or a flu shot. Registration is preferred but not required for a full list of these locations. You'll find it on our website, WRBL.com. And you're watching News 3 this morning, and here's Nicole with your morning commute forecast on this Thursday. Nicole? Hey, so 33 minutes past the hour, still dealing with some dense fog this morning, although we're starting to see things improve just a little bit more. We're in the 30s to even low 40s to start off, so it's chilly. You're going to need the coats this morning, but 55 degrees by lunchtime, and then getting into the middle 60s for our evening commute with increasing clouds. We will be back into the 70s on Friday, then a chance for storms on Saturday. Saturday. I'll time it out for you coming up in 10 minutes. All right, Nicole, and we thank you for trusting news through this morning. We'll be right back. All righty, folks, you know what time it is. Time now for Bear's Wake Up Call. Good morning to you, Bear. Having a really great week and going to even get better today with what you got planned, right? We've got a wonderful week going. Everything's good with me. How about y'all? Man, doing yeah. well. One day away from Friday, you know, getting closer and closer to Christmas. Normally, I look forward to it, but uh, Crystal, maybe you can relate to this. I have not uh, done all the shopping that I need to do yet. So I need a couple extra days. Yeah. And you know what? You just passed it to me and set me up for something. You said the week's getting better, and I didn't even say it, so I will say it. I get to hold my, my granddaughter for the first time this morning. I'm going to stop by the hospital. And oh, that's going to be so exciting. So, yes, it, the week is getting better. But uh, enough about me. I know you need to say hello to somebody, Blake. Yes, I want to say good morning to Mary Howard. I met her at Macy's the other day while knocking out some Christmas shopping. Uh, she stopped and said hello and said she watches us uh, every morning. And so I just want to say oh. good morning to Mary and, and thank her for, for watching us in the morning. Mm -hmm. That is so great. Hi, Mary. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us every morning. Hey, Crystal. Hey, hey, Bear. How are you? Yeah, everything's great. Just want to say hello. <laughs> Listen, folks, I want to talk to you about something personal just a moment. I, I don't know how many years ago, it's probably been 20 years ago, that I met my friend Robert. And I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Robert is one of the most beautiful people you ever met. He's always wanting to give. He's always giving. He's a veteran. I don't know exactly when he served, but it was years and years ago. But he'll talk to you freely about being a ver veteran, how much he loves this country. He's a good Christian man. He talks about loving the Lord. But I got to know him. I remember one of the first times I was around him, I was having lunch. And I think my wife and I both were having lunch. And as we went to pay, they said, well, that gentleman over there has already paid for your lunch. And that's how I met him. Now, Robert has gone through throat cancer. And he has to talk with a voice box. And a lot of times I had trouble. That's, I got used to it by telling him I just want to be honest. Instead of being uncomfortable around him, I said, look, Robert, slow down so I can understand. And he will. He'll slow so I can understand everything he's saying, 
And I just, every time I know, if he calls me on the phone, I love talking to him. I see him out in places here, there, and everywhere. We go to the same places pretty much. And I always see Robert, and he just brings me to a high level in my day because he just really builds people up. And he's a, such a positive person. Well, yesterday I was shopping for groceries, and I looked, and there's old Robert. I hadn't seen him in probably three or four months. And I walked up and grabbed his hand. I said, hey, man. And I went and I hugged him. And as I did, I pulled back, and, and he didn't have his voice box with him, and he was having to just kind of whisper. And I couldn't understand. Well, there was no whisper to it. It's just no noise at all. And I couldn't understand what he was saying. I just said, well, you know, I love you. And I, I went to hug him. And the, the four words that I understood plain as day, because he started getting tears in his eyes, and I said, what is it? And I heard him say, the cancer is back. And it just, uh, we hugged there in the grocery store, and the more I said, the more he got teary-eyed, and the more, I just wanted to let him know I loved him. And so we didn't visit long, but I walked away thinking the whole world is looking at positive things right now, and Christmas is on the way, and we were just celebrating my, my uh, granddaughter's birth and, and all these wonderful things. And Robert, at this point in his life, he's scared. And he's worried. And, uh, you know, he knows where he's going to be if something were to happen. But I just was going to ask you, because I know a lot of folks that watch are praying folks. Would you all please lift him up? Just lift up Robert uh, for healing and for him to, you know, and get his whole, his whole mind straightened out about this whole thing. Because I could tell it was really, really getting to him. So please, please lift him up if you don't mind. And I hope you didn't mind me using my time to ask that this morning. Because he means so much to me. And I just need you all to do that. He's a beautiful person. Absolutely, yes. Bear. And we thank you for just sharing a little bit more about Robert uh, with us this morning. And Bear, what I appreciate about you is that you, you share these stories with folks because you believe in the power of prayer. And I know there's a lot of people who watch us that also believe in the power of prayer. And so I think that this invites more people in to, to continue praying for him. And so we appreciate yeah. that. And um, keep us updated, Bear, please. I, I sure will. And I thank you all so much. And Robert had no idea I was going to do that. I don't even know if he's watching this morning. But if you are, brother, I love you. And I'm praying. We're, got, we're all going to be praying. Uh, here's something kind of weird. Let's move and change gears here for a second. Did you know if you put up your Christmas tree, and you may have done it last year, year before this, maybe it happened this year, and all of a sudden once the tree gets up and it's all decorated, you start having Internet problems in the house. Your Wi-Fi is just not working. Well, before you make that phone call and spend the money for the cable <laughs> folks or whoever to come out and check it out, it could be your Christmas tree. Here's what it says. If you decorated your place for the holidays, putting anything in front of your router can cause issues, especially big things like Christmas trees. Something that big can block the signal and wreck your Internet speed. So if the tree's blocking the line of sight for your router, move the router or the tree. And also, here's a big deal. If you've got metal on that tree, if you've got tinsel on it, it'll really mess it up. And don't ever plug your router in or plug your tree in. The lights in the same plug you got the router plugged in because the blinking lights... They'll mess up the signal. Just a few things you need to know. If you're having internet trouble, it could be the tree. It depends on where it is. Very, Start. very important information. I got some rearranging to do when I get home today because clearly <laughs> this all makes a lot of sense. I won't say any more, but I'm going to do some rearranging. Thank you, Bear. <laughs> all right, all right. Just so you're already having problems. I got you. Uh, I don't have time to bring you anything else, but thank you for the time you do give me. God bless you. I love you, and I pray for you. A great day, and I can't wait to see you for Friday. All righty. We'll see you tomorrow, Bear. Thanks for being with us this morning. And we thank you for trusting News 3. We'll see you right back here. Uh, actually, I was about to dismiss the show. The show is not over with yet. We'll be right back. <laughs>
on your side. Meteorologist Nicole Phillips has your first alert forecast. Well, good Thursday morning. Still dealing with some dense fog. Our dense fog advisory goes through 10 a.m. Eastern time, so 9 a.m. Central. For all of the counties shaded in gray here, and this is why we've had low visibility throughout most of the morning. But we are starting to see a little bit of an improvement, especially as we take a look out in Auburn this morning. Not seeing too much fog, but again, Phoenix City and into Columbus, up to Pine Mountain, you follow Americas. All of us have been dealing with some dense fog, and again, that will improve over the course of the next few hours. So 32 degrees. Up in LaGrange, 35 in Butler, 38 in Fort Gaines. So it's a chilly start to the morning. But we warm up. We're getting into the middle 50s as we head towards noon, then middle 60s by 4 p.m. You will notice clouds will be increasing today. 65 degrees for the high temperature in Columbus today, and 62 in Butler. So other than the fog that we have this morning, it's pretty calm. Our next system, however, will be moving in as we go into Saturday afternoon, and that's going to give us the chance for some strong storms. So until then, again, today. Today, just noticing an increase of clouds. What's going to happen is by this evening, late this evening, I should say, after about 7 p.m., we'll have this batch of rain that will be moving in. So this is right around 10 p.m. That will move up towards the northeast, and that's going to set us up really for off and on showers late this evening, overnight, and into early Friday morning. Now, our next system, again, that I just showed you on our satellite and radar that's out towards the west, it's going to cause some issues before it gets here. Severe weather in portions of Tennessee, even towards uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, and down towards Louisiana. So we've got this enhanced risk for areas like Memphis on Friday. The risk starts to shift towards the east and southeast on Saturday. This is a level one out of five, so a marginal risk of severe weather. And at the moment, what we're talking about here will just be some gusty winds out ahead and along the front. So here's the setup. Warm front will lift north through the area as we go into Friday morning, and with it, it will bring us some showers. Also, on Friday afternoon, you'll notice it will be significantly warmer and also a little bit muggy. So, feeling more like spring because, yes, that warm front has lifted towards the north, but we're also going to get a little bit more moisture coming in from the Gulf, which is just really going to set our atmosphere up to be primed for some strong storms on Saturday. So, Saturday, 3 p.m., just a few storms out along ahead of the front. The actual front starting to pull through right around 7 to 8 p.m., and then it will continue to do so on Saturday night. Behind this front, it will be cooler, and we're also going to see calmer conditions. So weather aware on Saturday, again, that front coming through. 75 degrees on Friday, 71 on Saturday. Behind the front, we're in the 50s, but not for long. 68 degrees on Tuesday, 70 by Wednesday. Alrighty, thank you, Nicole. And as we approach International Women's Month in March, News 3 is recognizing the contributions women are making to our nation and our local communities. Remarkable Women is part of a nationwide Next Art Media effort to honor the influence that women have had on public policy, social progress, and quality of life. Nominees will be accepted through December 31st. So to fill out a nomination form, all you have to do is head to our website, WRBL.com, and you'll see the big banner at the very top of our homepage. And speaking of amazing women, and let's meet one this morning. Connecticut Credit Union's Golden Apple Award honoree is a hardworking math teacher from Fort Middle School in Columbus. Meet Sierra Brooks. She accepted her Golden Apple Award from News 3's Carlos Williams and Connecticut Credit Union's Clint Perkins. She was nominated by Jennifer Thomas, who says her son went from doubting his smarts to making the honor roll. All thanks to Miss Brooks. I had the privilege of teaching him last year when we were hybrid. Um, he was one of the students who came in. He was eager to learn. So I am very grateful to know that I am having a lasting impression on my students. And congratulations again to Ms. Brooks. Of course, if you know a deserving teacher like her, you can head to our website, WRBL.com, to fill out the nomination form. Well, relief is on the way for folks facing eviction over in Russell County this holiday season. The Salvation Army of Columbus just received a grant from the Russell County Coronavirus Response Fund, and now that money is, used, is being used to help those who might be behind on rent. Renters can apply Monday through Thursday by swinging by the Salvation Army 2nd Ave location in Columbus and filling out an application. Once the application is complete, a caseworker will meet with the renter 101 to determine the financial assistance needed. Take a listen. It is a challenging time, but we always have our doors open, and we try to assist as many clients as we possibly can. Uh, we can't help everyone, but we help as many as we can. 
The grant only applies to Russell County residents and will run until January of 2022 or while supplies last. We thank you for trusting News 3 this morning. Coming up, a 26-year police veteran says it was an accident when she fatally shot a man during a traffic stop. We'll dive into that ongoing trial when we come back. On your side, you're watching WRBL News 3 this morning. Well, opening statements followed by a testimony in the trial of Kim Potter, the former Minnesota police officer, says she mistakenly drew a gun when she shot and killed the 20 year old Dante Wright. Laura Podesta has more. In the same courtroom where former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty of murdering George Floyd, Another white officer, Kim Potter, sits trial connected to the death of a black man named Dante Wright. In April, police pulled over 20-year-old Wright for expired license plate tags and an air freshener hanging from his rearview mirror, which is illegal in Minnesota. They then discovered he had an outstanding warrant. <laughs> Video from Potter's body cam shows police attempting to arrest Wright before he gets back in his car. Potter then pulls out her pistol while repeatedly shouting taser. She then shoots right in the chest. We trust them to know wrong from right and left from right. The defense claimed in opening statements Potter mistakenly grabbed the wrong weapon while trying to protect another officer who would have gotten hurt had right driven away. This was an accident. She's a human being, but she had to do what she had to do to prevent a death to a fellow officer, too. Wright's mother spoke to the court about the pain that accident has created. But I wanted to go comfort my baby. I wanted to hold him. Potter's expected to testify on her own behalf next week. Laura Podesta, CBS News. Now, Potter is no longer on the Brooklyn Center Police Force. The 26 year veteran resigned shortly after that shooting. And we turn now to meteorologist Nicole Phillips, who has what you need to know before you go this morning. Give yourself some time. There is fog out there, but Nicole, it is starting to in, uh, improve a little bit, right? Yeah, we're seeing a little bit of an improvement, and that's some good news. When we look at current visibility, notice we've got nine miles, so that's how many miles we can see out ahead of us. That's doing pretty good compared to earlier, where a lot of us, we were struggling to see visibilities above a mile or so. So just take it easy this morning. Dense fog advisory through 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Central.
So 32 degrees in the Grange, 39 in America is looking pretty good out in Tumor's Corner. So once we get rid of the fog, we'll see increasing clouds. Temperatures in the middle 60s today, but we'll be in the middle 70s on Friday. Your seven-day forecast coming up after the top 10. All righty, thank you, Nicole. And before we head out the door, we're counting down the top 10 stories that you need to know about this morning. All righty, number 10, our Holiday Heroes campaign continues next Wednesday, December 15th. Our News 3 team will be at the McDonald's on Macon Road in Columbus, accepting your generous donations of new or gently used blankets, winter coats, hats, gloves, and shoes. We certainly hope to see you there. Number nine, International Women's Month is coming up in March, and WRBL is recognizing the remarkable women in our community. Nominees are being accepted now through December 31st. Head to our website to fill out that nomination form. Number eight, congrats to this morning's Golden Apple Award winner. Sierra Brooks teaches math at Fort Middle School in Columbus. Jennifer Thomas says Ms. Brooks helped her son love school and improve his grades. Of course, you can nominate a deserving teacher like Ms. Brooks on our website. Number seven, doctors are urging some unvaccinated pregnant moms to consider. Consider getting the COVID-19 vaccine. They say the virus causes complications, which puts both mother and baby at risk. Now, doctors say some of their unvaccinated patients develop severe illness from COVID-19. Number six, Pfizer says its booster shot increases protection against the Omicron variant by 25 percent. This comes as COVID-19 hospitalizations jump across the country. That's all thanks to the Delta variants, what health leaders are saying. At number five, the Department of Public Health is hosting mobile vaccine clinics this week. They'll be at the Elizabeth Canty Homes on Casita Road from 1 until 4 p.m. There you can get the COVID-19 vaccine or get yourself a flu shot. Registration is preferred but not required. And for a full list of that locations, head over to our website. That's WRBL.com. And number four, the Russell County Coronavirus Response Fund is granting the Salvation Army of Columbus money to help those behind on rent. You can apply by visiting the Salvation Army Second Ave location and filling out an application. The Salvation Army says the grant only applies to Russell County residents and will run until January of 2022 or while supplies last. Number three, Columbus police are looking for a man missing for over a month. They say 31 year old Javier Hernandez was last seen in November the 4th on Young Avenue in Columbus. He's five foot one and weighs 170 pounds. Police say he also has a sleeve tattoo. Please call CPD if you know where he may be. And number two, a man in the Muskogee County Jail on theft charges will soon be extradited to Alabama to face an unrelated murder charge. Though the police say 19 year old Solomon Cooper is charged with capital murder following the deadly shooting of 20 year old at Sincere Tyson in October. Once in Dothan, Cooper will be held without bond. At number one, a 45 year old cold case is back open after a victim's car and unidentified remains were found in Casita. Troop County Sheriff James Woodruff confirms that the car belongs to Kyle Klinkscale, who was 22 when he went missing back in 1976. Now, two people, Jimmy Jones and Gene Johnson, were previously arrested in that case. And uh, those are your top 10 stories. The meteorologist Nicole Phillips is on top of your final forecast this hour. Nicole, a relatively calm day, but this weekend, some stuff to watch out for. Yeah, we've got some stuff to watch out for on Saturday, but until then, it won't be too bad today, especially. It's a little bit soupy out there. We've got fog, but that will clear 65 degrees today, 75 degrees on Friday. Weather where on Saturday, they were in the 50s on Sunday and Monday. All right, now it's time to announce our next winner of our coffee mug contest. Yes, and today's winner is Deborah Peters. Congratulations. And we want to thank our morning mug sponsors, Wild Superfast Internet and Wild Animal Safari. And you can pick up your coffee mug at our News 3 studio at the address you see right there on your screen. And don't forget, you got to be in it to win it. So head to our website, WRBL.com, to enter into the contest. And that does it for us. We'll see you back here bright and early tomorrow morning. Have a great Thursday.